This is Invest Talk. Independent thinking, shared success. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley stand ready to take your finance and investment questions and share their unbiased answers. Invest Talk is made possible by KPP Financial, a registered investment advisor firm serving clients throughout the United States. The clarity for your path forward starts now. Here is KPP Chief Executive Officer, Financial Advisor, Justin Klein. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. And today I want to start off with just a quick overview of the FTX situation. Uh, if anyone's paying a little bit of attention, there's uh, basically a giant fraud within the uh, the crypto space. And if anybody was looking under the hood or you know, decided to pay attention, uh, they would have found it. And there were some people that were calling it well before uh, the, the collapse. But what I want to do is use this as a teaching moment for everybody to avoid financial frauds and learn how to recognize them and throw up the red flag when you see certain things happening. So for example, number one, promise of high returns or guaranteed returns, especially guaranteed returns that are pretty high. You know, I, over the past couple of years, I've had some callers call in asking about, you know, why wouldn't I stake my crypto and, and earn 10, 12, 15 percent uh, when money market back then at least was yielding 1 percent or 0 percent. And I said, well, counterparty risk. And, you know, when it's too good to be true, it probably is. Right. And a lot of what FDX was touting was that that they were doing arbitrage and uh, they were using those funds to uh, bail out other others in the crypto space that were also doing some shady things and collapsing. Um, so it's pretty clear that, you know, those high returns they promised didn't make sense. And that should have been everyone's first red flag. Okay. The second red flag is uh, Sam Bakeman Fried, SBF, uh, he promised that he was doing all this, he was getting rich so that he could give away the money. So charity. And that there was something altruistic about what he was doing. Now, he didn't give away much at all up until now, but he always promised in the future when he got to a certain level, he would give it away. First off, I think that's Obviously, that was that was uh, shady um, and not correct. Um, but a lot of fraudsters utilize religion or charity in order to, you know, rope in uh, the people that they that, that that they're trying to dupe. Okay, and this happens a lot in church. Uh, you see a lot of frauds in church where. You know, people think that they these the, because they go to church with them that they're also as uh, upstanding and 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 God fearing as they are, um, and in reality, you know, that's often not the case. Um, and so, uh, and that could be for anything. You know, whether that's they they're they're in your um, they go to your gym or you know they do things they have interests that are similar to you uh, that a lot of people feel comfortable with that, um, and it blinds them to other aspects of, of what they're doing. So affinity fraud is, is very big. And then lastly, attacking critics. Uh, when you see people that are, are, are kind of uh, accused uh, of, of crimes, accused of fraud, accused of being too good to be true, um, if, if, if they're legit, they kind of brush off the critiques and they kind of move on because they have confidence in what they're doing. The ones that snap back harshly against their critics uh, and try to take them down uh, and, and really, really ruin them uh, the other way, a lot of it's just gaslighting. Um, and they know that they're underneath the surface, it's not real. Uh, and thus, they 
you know, they, there's a lot of uh, uh, kickback uh, there. Uh, and so those that are super aggressive towards their critics uh, often uh, means their critics are probably uh, pretty accurate. So, um, you know, these are some lessons to be taken from the FTX collapse and uh, the Sam Bankman freed fraud. And, and there's a lot of shady characters within that whole, uh, whole, whole space in general, but also uh, FTX. Uh, there was a character that committed fraud and poker sites uh, back in their mid 2000s. So, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, you got to do, do your due diligence and make sure that the people that you're uh, you're trusting with your money, with your investments uh, are upstanding and they don't have a history of, uh, of these types of, of issues. And and they're not utilizing, you know, uh, the, the tools that most uh, fraudsters uh, utilize, which is trying to get you to trust them in some way uh, that is obviously not uh, not true. Now, I'm Justin Klein. I'm here ready to answer your finance and investment questions on today's radio show and podcast. So I look forward to this hour with you. And the phone number is always 888 chart That's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can call and ask your question and we can do that live. Uh, you can leave a message, excuse me, and you can do that live from four to five Pacific time. Now I have a lot of material for you to discuss with you today. One is on the average net worth of Gen X. So I know we have a lot of Gen X listeners, uh, but I think it's always interesting to see, uh, to review that part of the, uh, the, our listener base and, and the investor um, base. So uh, I also want to get to the trends in the office space, uh, especially in relation to the tech companies. You know, they're laying off workers in a big way, and that means they are putting a lot of office square footage on market for sublease, uh, and this is going to weaken the office rental market even more. I also want to touch on the opportunities in the corporate bond markets that a lot of hedge funds are picking up on. And then lastly, Japan's waning appetite for our our debt. And that is a an issue that needs to people need to keep an eye on because uh, that could create more illiquidity within the treasury market. All right. Now, we also have some voice bank questions ready to play for you today. One is on investor sentiment as well as AOS. So I've got this all planned for this episode of Invest Talk. And of course, we're taking your live calls as well at 888 chart now Let's take a look at the market today. We had the S&P that was up about 34 points, a little less than 1%. Today was a Kind of a good day for uh, tech stocks or uh, growth stocks in general. Uh, a little bit of a bounce back there, and a lot of had to do with the fact that yields were down. Ten year was down uh, about six and a half basis points, hit three point eight percent, and uh, this is not shocking. Uh, I said this before. There's a lot of resistance on that four and a quarter uh, level, and I think we're going to likely pull back here, probably a bit of, a bit more, maybe uh, to the three point four, three point five percent range. I think that's where there's going to be major support on the 10 years. So uh, to see kind of a grind lower uh, into the new year would not shock me at all. And obviously that's going to give a lift to the markets in general. But I do think you're going to get a bit of a counter trend rally in growth stocks and into year end. And but that's just a counter trend rally. Uh, the, the longer term trend of value over growth uh, still is in place. Um, but you know, you're always going to have the, these counter trend rallies. So uh, that was the market today. Nice, nice positive day. Continue to see upside um, into your end. Gold was strong. Uh, the dollar overall was was weak as well. Um, so commodity prices did well. So you know, well, a lot of those aspects that have been headwinds to uh, asset prices over this year: higher interest rates, stronger dollar. Today, uh, those reversed a, a, a bit more. So that's why you're seeing uh, some more upside. Now we're heading into a break. Steve and I are happy to play your recorded voice bank questions and we love your live calls as well. Our number never changes and it never closes. So give InvestTalk a call at 888-99-CHART. Why do listener questions make Invest Talk better? Which of these would you recommend? Because each caller presents fresh questions in their voice. I was curious if you still 
think aluminum has a ways to go from here. When do I know the right time to take profits? Should I be looking for an exit? Should I be holding here? And listeners instinctively realize that Invest Talk uniquely offers a welcome dose of investing satisfaction. I think you have a terrific show, and I've learned a whole lot. Hey guys, love your show. Uh, I've been listening for several years now, and I've learned a lot. Justin Klein and Steve Peasley understand what investors need and want. I would look at it from a tax perspective. If there's no tax implications, move on, find better ways to use that money. I'm going with the odds. I think a half position now would at least get you in it and get you watching it so you won't lose track of it. Don't forget to call Investor 888-99-CHART. One of the most rewarding things I do each weekday is host the Invest Talk podcast. I truly enjoy helping investors, and I know that every question counts and every answer I provide will be unbiased. You, the caller, get to chart the course for each Invest Talk podcast. Call with your questions anytime, day or night, 888 99Chart. Let's go talk to jo- uh, Jacob. He's in the Bay Area. He wants to talk about the wash rule. Yeah, hey, Justin, how you doing? Good, good. Yeah, so I am just curious. So I uh, am starting to do some tax harvesting as we get closer to the end of the year Mm -hmm. uh, in my brokerage account. And I was just curious, if I were to, let's just say, sell Lumen and -hmm. then pick it up in my wife's IRA, would that still allow me to take uh, some tax benefits from that, or does that not work because we're married and it's uh, her IRA? Hmm, that's an interesting one. I hate the wash rule questions because those are a lot of people try to do that. Um, that's interesting because you're it's two separate. It, oh, well, here's a question: You in your taxable account? Is this your account? What's the title on this account? Is it a joint account or is this in your name? No, it's just uh, under my name. Hmm. I would and say that probably IRA would be fine. Um, once again, this is a CPA question. I hate the wash rule question because there are these. Everyone wants to try to play these little games and uh, the IRS doesn't like those games. Um, I would imagine that would be, that would qualify because you are two separate people. Now, if that's a joint account, her name's on the account and then you go buy in her Roth, that wouldn't work. You're two separate people. I would talk to a CPA. I, I, I frankly, I don't have a clear answer for you, but it sounds like to me that it would be that because it's two separate people, um, despite the fact that you're uh, filing together, that would work, but this is a question for a CPA. So thanks for the call. Let's go to James in Georgia. He wants to talk about HYG. Yeah, hey, uh, Justin, I was looking at this ETF, um, and it's a uh, high yield corporate bond ETF. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about taking a position in this and was curious your, um, your opinion. Well, let's say this. Uh, what's your goal here? Is it just the income? Uh, are you trying to play this for a trade? Uh, what, 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 are you, what are you looking at here? Well, I was going to try to hold, you know, a long-term hold. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's a good way to gain access to the corporate bond market. Um, you know, these are high, this is a high-yield bond fund. It's probably the biggest high-yield bond fund out there. Uh, its expense ratio is about... A little less than 50 basis points. So I wouldn't call that low. I wouldn't call that high. Um, you know, 5% yield, it's nice. Um, you know, we're getting on corporate credits closer to 7% and much better average credit quality. So this is double B minus. Uh, we're typically double B plus to triple B minus kind of in that area. Um, so I think you can do better with individual bonds. Um, but if you just want kind of a set it and forget it exposure, this is not a bad way to go. And, and the reason I say that is because it's relatively short duration, only about four years on its, uh, on its effective duration. And you're taking credit risk, which I rather take credit risk over duration risk. So if you're trying to get yield, um, this is kind of the, the type of bond exposure that you would want. Is it the perfect uh, you know, way to gain exposure? I would say no. Once again, I, I'd rather own individual positions um, than this fund because I don't love bond funds because you can lock in permanent losses, et cetera. Um, but you know, it, it's not a bad way to exposure. It, uh, it, it's, it's once again, it's uh, the largest uh, pretty much within the space 
Uh, that and J and K. Let's see. Actually, J and K is another one. Let's. I wonder which one's bigger. Let's see, this one's seventeen billion in assets. J and K is. Pull this up here. Nine point eight. So yeah, so it's larger than than J and K. So uh, once again, I think it's fine, but I think you can do better if you do a little work. But if you don't want to do any work, it's fine. Thanks for the call. Now it's a fast moving Tuesday. The market is constantly changing. Six, about a month ago, five weeks ago, everyone was bearish. Now market's in an uptrend. So the market is changing constantly, rapidly. And that probably means you have new questions and I have answers for you. So you set the agenda for this hour, but you have to give us a call at 888 chart Two portfolios are alike, and every investor has a unique set of circumstances. The best way to get answers that correspond with your situation is for you to submit your questions to Steve Peasley and Justin Klein. The 24-hour listener line never closes, so don't forget to call InvestTalk, 888-99-CHART. Now my focus point drills down on the story behind this question. What is the average net worth of Gen X, Gen Xers? And this is dubbed the lost generation. This is the generation between the largest cohorts of our, uh, of our country, which is the baby boomers and the millennials. These are individuals born between 1965 and 1980. And according to the Federal Reserve's 2019 survey, Americans between the age of 42 and 57 have an average mean net worth between 468,000, sorry, 436,200 and 1.1 million. So it varies dramatically a lot based on, you know, whether you're an older Gen X or a younger Gen X. Now this is a challenging demographic uh, to to be in right now because a lot of the Gen Xers have children still in school, but they also have parents that are old and they need to support, need to take care of. So financially, a lot of them are challenged. Now, compared to other generations, the average Gen Xers net worth is on the higher end, but where they fall short is retirement savings in general. And a lot of this has to do with cost of living and inflation. And there were some interesting studies, one by State Street. And they said this generation is most concerned by the effects of inflation, the stock market, and the economy, and what that could have on their financial situation. Transamerica retirement studies found that only 22% of Gen X workers are very confident they will be able to fully retire with a comfortable lifestyle. And just 28% strongly agree that they are building a large enough retirement nest egg. So only, only half uh, are, are confident. 80% are concerned that Social Security will not be available to them once they do hit retirement. Now, the median annual earnings for Gen Xers uh, is about $97,000, the median. So, excuse me, the average, that's the mean. Now, this is a generation that has seen a lot of booms and busts. In the late 90s, Gen Xers made up a very large portion of the workforce, especially the younger workers during that time. A lot of them were tech workers. And so, some of them rode the wave up in valuations for their shares. Some of them sold in time, others did not, but they did see that bubble burst and a lot of them felt it either through job losses or through just their equity stakes going up in flames. I remember this uh, in the late nineties when I was uh, just coming up and our uh, invest talk aired in San Diego and in San Diego, there's Qualcomm the headquarters. And we had a lot of Qualcomm 
clients. And I remember my grandfather going to them and, and, and you know, they would come with seven figure portfolios. That was all Qualcomm stock. And he would say, well, you need to diversify. And very few of them did. And many of them rode their seven figure portfolios all the way down to, you know, hundred to 200 grand. You know, because Qualcomm went from a high of $98 in, in 99 all the way to 13 bucks. So you had a massive drawdown there. So they felt that. Then you had the financial crisis, and a lot of them were homeowners. A lot of Gen Xers were homeowners. And they saw the steepest drop in home equity during that time, uh, as well as double whammy of their 401k holdings, equity holdings uh, going down in value. The median net worth for Gen Xers declined 38% from 2007 to 2010. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, 22% of Gen Xers reported that, that their household income fell by 50% or more. Now then the question is, what do you do now? Now that uh, entering, not pre-retirement age, but you know most Gen Xers, they're in their peak earning age uh, and it, it might feel like hey this is going to last for a while you, know, you might be in your 40s or early 50s and i got a while until retirement well it goes by fast and so there's a few things to make sure anyone should do one is avoid lifestyle creep when you earn a good amount of money you tend to spend a little bit more on the finer things in life keeping up with the joneses Right, bigger house, maybe an exotic car, expensive vacations, etc. So avoiding that and making sure that your number one priority is saving beyond your, you know, your everyday uh, needs. So avoiding that lifestyle creep. And then number two is make sure you pay down any debt. It might, especially the high high interest debt. Maybe not your 3% mortgage, but your high interest debt, definitely paying that down. Uh, that can weigh on your monthly budget and your ability to save. And then lastly, it's time to think about long-term care, uh, potentially, you know, you're, now that you still qualify. So those are kind of some tips for Gen Xers. Now the next and best talk, the story behind this headline, the, Fed's re the Fed reports that household debt soared at its fastest pace in 15 years. That story tomorrow that I'll get to, but I'm Justin Klein and I'm ready to take your questions live at 888 chart When you drive the brand ranked number one in dependability by J.D. Power, you can stop thinking about what you can't do and start doing what you never thought possible. Visit your local Kia dealer today to see yourself behind the wheel of the brand ranked number one in dependability by J.D. Power. Kia, movement that inspires. Call 800-333-4KIA for details. Always drive safely. Kia received the fewest reported problems among all brands in the J.D. Power 2022 U.S. Vehicle Dependability Study based on 2019 models. See jdpower.com slash awards for 2022 details. Get more for your money this week at Meyer. No matter what you need, save with deals like 10% off general merchandise apparel and shoes with Emberg's, 50% off select Ophelia Row women's tops and pants, and 20% off board games and puzzles. Plus, start decorating for the holidays with buy one, get one 50% off indoor holiday decor or stockings. And you'll always pay the same low Meyer prices no matter how you shop, in-store or online. Get more for your money at Meyer. Exclusions apply. See all the deals in the Meyer app. This podcast is brought to you by Udemy, a leading destination for learning and teaching online. Need to learn professional skills for your career? Join millions of people learning the latest skills in business and tech on Udemy. Udemy has helped learners around the world launch new careers, advance in their current field, and earn money on the side. Visit udemy.com and find the course for you. Have you heard about Riskalyze? It's a brief question and answer form that you fill out online. Steve Peasley and Justin Klein will also get a copy of your responses. They can use the Riskalyze results to help you formulate a strategy that fits your investing risk tolerance. Learn more anytime and take the Riskalyze quiz at investtalk.com. Hi, Justin and Steve. 
longtime listener to the show and uh, learned a lot from you guys. Thank you for everything you do. I have a question and your thoughts on the stock AOS. I've been doing some research on it. It seems like a good stock. It's been moving up. It seems, um, I don't know if it's in the industrial sector and makes parts that will be needed forever, it looks like. I believe it makes furnace parts, and it also pays a dividend. Just wondering what your thoughts were on this. It looks like a stock. I'm looking to find it that I could just stick it in my portfolio and let it sit there for years and years, and it would keep uh, growing for me and making me money. Uh, I'll be interested in hearing your thoughts on this one. Thank you very much. All right, this is AOS, uh, AO Smith Corp. Uh, we actually own this for, for clients. Uh, it has come down pretty dramatically, about 30% from off its 52-week high. Uh, we recently purchased it, I want to say, over the last uh, three to six months. Um, but uh, I do, we do like the business. It, uh, it does make uh, mainly water heaters uh, for the, the residential market. It uh, makes uh, also commercial gas, gas, uh, tankless gas, um, uh, t- tankless yeah, gas uh, containers, uh, electric water heaters. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a consistent business. Like I said, uh, it's return on equity. Right now is about 27%. Now it's a little bit higher than its long-term average in the low 20s, but still 22, 23% is a very strong and consistent uh, return on equity uh, that we really, really like. Uh, and so and now the valuation is at least reasonable, trading at a 12 times enterprise value to EBITDA, which is typically the low end of, of where it trades. Um, you know, the biggest issue though is China. Uh, and about 60% of its revenue comes from North America. 24% though comes from China. And that's really the, 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 the reason why it's down so much and the worry of you know, how much will, drag that will be on their business overall. And, and we do think it's going to be a drag, especially because uh, Chinese uh, demand for water heaters and, and, and uh, real estate is certainly going to be hampered by their slower growth. Um, so I think that's the issue, but it's sufficiently cheap enough now to where even if uh, that Chinese business is cut in half, uh, then it's still going to be sufficiently cheap um, and their business is remains still very strong. So I do think this is a good long term play down here. Uh, our value is closer to the highs that you saw uh, late last year around uh, eighty dollars. And as a trading sixty dollars and change, two percent dividend yield. Um, so we really like uh, A O Smith Corporation. Now let's make it two in a row. This invest talk question came in earlier on eight at eight ninety nine chart. Hi Stephen Justin. Recently Justin was talking about the put call ratio, giving a, us an idea of uh, investor sentiment. I'm wondering how does that really give us an idea of what investor community is is thinking. Uh, really, because when people are buying a lot of puts and the put call ratio is high, aren't there an equal number of people also selling those puts? So, you know, for every one person that is buying the put and thinking the, the stock market is going lower, there's a there's another person selling it. So those people are bullish on the stock market as a whole. I understand the, the idea, but for every person buying those puts, there's someone selling them and, and feels the opposite way. Maybe you can uh, talk a little, a little bit about that on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. That is a good observation. Uh, but what you are missing there are the institutions. And n- not every option that is traded is by, say, an individual or uh, an investor uh, is the other side isn't always another individual or uh, investment is an institution. Oftentimes it is a market maker. Um, it is, uh, a trading institution that will, uh, take both sides and they're balancing, uh, their book, uh, and their, uh, their risk. And so that's, that's the difference there. Um, so there's what are called open interest. 
Um, and that, so that's one factor that, that, that I want to get to, but also open interest. So um, the amount of call options and put options that are created depends on the demand. Uh, and so when there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of demand for those put options. And those put options, once again, um, come into uh, existence uh, as another, uh, someone else takes the other side. And like I said, sometimes that's not an individual, sometimes that's a trading institution. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's, that's your answer. And it's not the only thing to look at when you're looking at investor sentiment. Uh, there's things like the AI uh, investor sentiment index, which basically canvases uh, average investors and see, you know, are you bullish bearish? Uh, there's also newsletter uh, sentiment. So looking at a bunch of different newsletters that go out and, you know, are, are, are they bullish or they're bearish? Uh, you can look at cash on the sidelines for mutual funds and uh, other types of, uh, of funds and whether they're bullish and bearish. Uh, and so is never one factor that you should point to to say, oh, this is overbought or this is oversold and, and this means the market should go up or should, or should go down. It's an, an amalgamation of various factors that you have to um, you have to weigh. Uh, and almost all of them universally in October were very bearish, which when that happens, when you line up those multiple factors from the put call ratio to the AI uh, sentiment uh, read, reader from newsletter uh, sub subscriptions um, to the VIX to you know a lot of factors that went into it to say, hey, everyone's pretty bearish right now. Uh, and then you look at the overall market and the economy and say, this hasn't been a great earnings quarter for Q3, but it's positive, mainly concentrated in, in energy and commodities, but um, it was still positive. And, you know, we're probably going to go into an earnings recession early next year, but the multiples still are pretty cheap based on those, uh, that, that mild earning or earnings recession. Um, and so you add all these things together and then you throw in, okay, what is a potential catalyst for upside, which is a fed pause and you get what you're getting now, a counter trend rally that could potentially turn into something else that's bigger and better and, and more upside, uh, you know, next year, if the earnings recession is very mild, uh, if the fed, if, if inflation comes down dramatically quickly and the fed maybe turns back to easing. Or maybe they pause for longer. Whatever it is, it's there's potential for the market to uh, start pricing in a more bullish scenario, and that's what you're seeing right now. Now the market's no longer super bearish, and, and, and uh, you know the markets no longer have really bad sentiment, um, but it's also not offsides the other way. You know, investors get offsides in both directions. I mean, I could easily see another month of, of upside in the markets and people saying, oh, the, the coast is clear. There's time to get back into the market. You know, what if we rally and we only close down high single digits on the year for the S&P? That's not a terrible year. It's a, eh, not a, not a good year, but it's not a terrible year. And that would likely change the narrative, change the sentiment. Does that mean the coast is clear? Not necessarily. Depends on the economic trends. So I like that you're thinking about this, um, but it's also not the only factor to look at when you're looking at a call ratio. Thanks for the call. Now let's touch on office space. And we know that the work from home trend has made office space in general more obsolete, maybe not completely obsolete, but more obsolete and, and weighed on the sector as a whole. But just as things look like they weren't, they, they, they couldn't get worse. Well, now you have layoffs. And I've said this about this recession, likely mild recession, but recession that it's going to be concentrated, the job losses are not going to be concentrated in the blue collar space. It's going to be white collar workers. 
tech workers, finance workers, and you're already seeing that in a big, big way. Amazon has now announced layoffs along with Meta, along with Lyft, along with Salesforce, et cetera. And all those companies are now shedding millions of square feet of office space in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, New York, Austin, Texas, and, and elsewhere. Amazon stopped construction on, on, in July on its new office building. And now the sector has placed about 30 million square feet of office space on the sublease market. That's more than triple the nine and a half million square feet they were looking to sublet, sublet uh, at the end of 2019. Now the national office, office vacancy rate is 12 and a half percent. That's up from 9.6 in 2019, and it's the highest level since 2011. And it's likely to go higher. Office buildings are backed by $1.2 trillion of the $5.4 trillion in total commercial real estate debt outstanding as the at the end of the second quarter. That's more debt than any other type of, of asset besides apartment buildings. And if landlords begin to default on a higher rate of those mortgages, that could create some, some distress. So Everyone's looking at the residential real estate market. I don't think that's where your, your problem is. It's the commercial. It's office. Overall, tech firms have about 500 million square feet of office space in 30 North American markets. And in San Francisco, businesses leased 850,000 square feet in the third quarter. That's compared to an average over the last five years of 2 million square feet. So demand is down about 60%. Salesforce, one of the city's largest employers, they're now subleasing about a third of its space in its 43 story tower in the business district. Meta was supposed to be the anchor of a new skyscraper in Austin. Now they're trying to sublease that space. And in 2021, the tech sector led all other businesses, counting for 20.5% of U.S. office leasing activity. The finance sector was 16, and the business sector was also 16. So what you're seeing here is triple whammy in the office market. Layoffs, higher interest rates, work from home, not a good place to be. So if you're going to invest in that part of the market, you have to be very, very careful. Now we're moving at a steady pace to the end of this year, just a few weeks, uh, six weeks left until New Year's. And it's been a challenging year. We've got a lot of changing market dynamics. And the question is, are you prepared for that? Both personally, as well as your portfolio. Are your strategies updated for this new type of market? Well, if you need help understanding if that's true, and I get to mix it back. I, I talk to listeners. Some of them are doing great. They're leaning on the value side of the market. Uh, they have the right exposure to different sectors, different, um, different equity markets, both domestically and abroad. And some are way off. You know, they're still overweight tech. They're overweight consumer cyclicals. They're overweight healthcare. And they're overweight growth stocks. And those are the ones that are the most challenged this year and are likely to be the most challenged going forward. So if you need help to figure out which bucket you're in, I encourage you to reach out to myself or Steve Peasley at our company, KAPP Financial, where we operate the same philosophy as we do here, which is independent thinking and shared success, and we provide unbiased guidance, both off and on, on and off air. And we practice parallel investing, which means we invest right alongside our clients. So I encourage you to head over to investtalk.com to schedule a free portfolio review assessment via telephone or go to meeting, or just head or just give us a call 800-557-5461. The sooner you contact us, the sooner we can get your portfolio optimized. Now we're heading into a break. And on the other side, we're going to get to another caller question. 
and then I have some parting thoughts for you today. So if you want to call and squeeze in in this last 10 minutes, you have to call 800-557-5461. You are listening to Invest Talk. Every Friday on the program and the podcast, Steve Peasley shares highlights from the newest edition of the KPP Premium Newsletter. Listen Fridays to Invest Talk. And now, Steve and Justin welcome your calls and questions. 888 99Chart. Hey, Steve. Hey, Justin. Justin, just want a heads up. Uh... You were going to answer questions about ticker symbol STAG, STAG Industrials, Real Estate Industrial REIT. I was looking forward to that question and answer, whether you thumbs up, thumbs down it, uh, your pros and cons, etc. As well, since uh, that question didn't get answered, maybe you could answer one more about ticker symbol TSE, Trinseo. I owned it on the giant up, made a solid profit, and now I bought back in and thinking it was at a low and it dipped lower than I expected. I've seen Trinseo buy back shares, but I've also seen them part ways with Chevron. They had a conglomerate. I just want to know what your insight is on this company, whether you like it or don't like it. I got in for the dividends and the growth. Just let me know. Uh, ticker symbol TSE. Again, stag wasn't answered. I know this podcast probably ran a little longer than normal, but I appreciate all you do. And if you can answer these questions, it'd be great. And for me, it's Friday, so enjoy your weekend. And hopefully, it's payday for somebody out there. Have a good one, y'all. Thanks for the call. And uh, my trusty team, uh, our engineer, Jorge, he informed me that we did answer that stat question on October 24th. Uh, so go check out that episode. But TSE is Trinseo, and they manufacture synthetic rubber, latex, and plastic products sold to the manufacturing industry. And their business did very well during the pandemic, went from uh, $3 in earnings back in 2019 all the way up to $9.64 last year. But analysts are now expecting earnings to be only $0.55 cents this year and $1.51 next year. So that's your issue is, you know, where is where is real earnings? What is the real earnings power of this business? You know, and it still hasn't reached its uh, peak from back in 2018 when it was over $80 per share. Now it's at 25 Last quarter, lost $2.91. Revenue is down 7%. Um, so I'm not liking those earnings trends. And the return on equity was very high. Uh, but now it is dipped down from a peak of about 64%, not only 6%. And looks like they have a good amount of debt on their balance sheet. So that worries me uh, in this environment. So I don't like companies that have a lot of debt and have businesses that are very up and down, very cyclical. Uh, this would not be a name I would get excited uh, to own. Now, technically, it's had a counter trend rally, but it's just rallying to its 100-day moving average. And today's a good example. It bounced right off that 100-day and pulled back uh, pretty dramatically about, what was it, down 6.5% today. So I would be looking to sell this on this rally. Uh, maybe it gets a little more legs, maybe to the 200-day moving average in the mid-30s. That's potential. Um, but I don't like the debt situation or the profitability being so up and down and so volatile. So I'm passing on Trinseo and go check out that October 24th episode. Now, lastly, I want to touch on Japan. And this is something you should be watching because Japan is the largest foreign owner of our debt. They own about $1.2 trillion of debt. They're the third largest economy in the world. And what they do with our debt, it could have a material impact on yields. Now those yields flow through to borrowing costs for businesses and consumers. And when the yen drops so precipitously as it has for all, all this year, that's been kind of fueling inflation uh, within the Japanese uh, economy. Now, part of that is good. They, they, they want inflation, but they don't want too much inflation. And recently they've been selling their foreign currency reserves and buying yen in the open market to support their currency. Now, when you own $1.2 trillion in treasuries, guess what? That means a lot of the reserves that they're selling are treasury bonds. 
Now, luckily, they've uh, basically been signaling that they've been only selling short-term treasury bonds, which are very liquid, very in high demand for uh, from money market funds and, and just short-term you know, cash-like instruments. Um, so that's very helpful. But the worry is that what happens if they start selling their longer-term bonds? And that, that would likely push up interest rates as well. And so there's... There's a lot of, and it's kind of boring, but it's plumbing within our financial system, our global financial system. When we have this level of debt, it can be a, an important thing to, to watch, is to see who are the buyers, who are the sellers, who historically have been buying, like Japan, and maybe are they no longer buying? And that's kind of what you're seeing now. And so that's also been uh, some fuel to see higher interest rates. So keep an eye on that Jap what, what Japan does with our bonds. Now, I'm Justin Klein. This is another Invest Talk program. Steve Peasley and I thank you for, for listening, and we encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. Invest Talk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1-800-557-5461. Steve Peasley is president and Justin Klein is chief executive officer of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial.